please, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading at verse 18. You can follow with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning tonight at verse 18. The Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ Jesus crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, and under the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Father, how we love you tonight, and how we thank you for being God, and for being the God that you are, for your attributes and your qualities, for the way you are, for, Father, we're just so dependent upon you, and we're so thankful that you're merciful and gracious and kind. And we just pray tonight that as we look into the Word of God, that your Holy Spirit would not only open the lips of your servant to speak, but the heart of everyone watching, listening, and in this place, that we might receive the Word of God, that we might grow thereby, that we might be enlightened thereby, that, Father, you might be glorified in it, Jesus might be magnified, we might be edified, sinners might be saved. We'll give you all the glory for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul is making a comparison in this little passage between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. It is interesting to note that the two are opposites. What the world calls wisdom, God calls foolishness. And what God calls wisdom, the world calls foolishness. Look at chapter 3, if you would. Turn over there, look at verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he hath taken the wise in their own craftiness. And so the world thinks that what God calls wisdom is foolishness, and God thinks what the world calls wisdom is foolishness. If you look at verse 18 in chapter 1 again, it says, For the preaching of the cross... To them that perish, it's foolishness. But to us, which are saved, it's the power of God. So the world thinks of preaching of the cross is foolishness. Look at verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And so God says his wisdom is preaching, and the world says it's foolishness. The world sees preaching as foolishness, doesn't it? The Bible says it's the power of God. The Bible says it's the wisdom of God. Look at verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. It's the power of God. And Paul writes that God's wisdom is so far above man's wisdom that man's wisdom is foolishness in comparison. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And so Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is trying to give us this picture that if God had a weakness, that weakness would still be stronger than the strength of men. And if God had any foolishness at all, his foolishness would be wiser than the wisdom of men. So he's trying to help us understand there's not even, a, you know, God's pre-kindergarten class is higher than the postgraduate studies at the world's highest university level Amen. when it comes to true wisdom. And why is this so? Because there is a wisdom that transcends human mind, a wisdom that is not of the physical universe, a wisdom that is a spiritual nature. John chapter 4, verse 24, the Bible says God is a spirit. And therefore his wisdom is spiritual. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 12. 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given unto us of God. Which things also we speak not in the world, words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And so there is a wisdom that is spiritual, and there is a wisdom that is physical. There is a wisdom that is natural, there is a wisdom that is supernatural. There is a wisdom of this world, there is a wisdom above this world. And one to the other is foolishness. Because in order to understand the spiritual wisdom, you have to have the Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Spirit of God, then the, then the spiritual wisdom is foolishness. You can't even catch it. You can't grasp it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. It's, look at this. Which none of the princes of this world knew. Now the princes, they're the most educated, aren't they? Sure they were. But they didn't even know this wisdom. They didn't even know this wisdom existed. And by the way, neither did you before you were saved. You didn't know this world existed. There's a whole world that came into play that you started seeing and knowing existed that you had no clue about before you got saved. Isn't that exciting? And so he says here, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. There is a wisdom that can only be known by those in whom the Spirit of God dwells, verse 11 of chapter 2. Look what it says, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So the natural man knows the wisdom of man because he has the Spirit of man. And the child of God can know the things of God because he has the Spirit of God. So we have the unique opportunity and ability to, in our human spirit, understand the wisdom of men, but in our spiritual condition as having the Spirit of God in us, we can understand the wisdom of the Spirit. So we, we have an edge, wouldn't you say so? So Paul gives an illustration of the foolishness of God that's wiser than men. Look at verse 26 of chapter 1. For we see your calling, brethren, not, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. That's the world's wisdom, isn't it? That's who the world wants their leaders to be, and those are their heroes. Look what he says, here's the wisdom of God. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So God says, what the world thinks is foolishness, I'm going to take what they think is foolishness, I'm going to make it wisdom. I'm going to make it do things they, couldn't, they can't believe it ever did. Man likes to boast in his baby talk wisdom. But true wisdom acknowledges its source, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to give you three wisdoms of God tonight that are the opposite of the wisdom of men. The first one we find in James chapter 4 verse 10. Number one is this. Here's the wisdom of God which is foolishness to the world. Number one, the way up is down. The way up is down. Look at James chapter 4 verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Now the world, the word translated humble yourselves here is the word, Greek word tapenao. It means to abase or to bring low. So God's saying, if you want to be lifted up, bring yourself low. If you want me, God says, to lift you up to higher ground, you need to bring yourself down to lower ground. If you want to be able to stand on your own two feet in, in the Lord, you need to start out on your knees before the Lord. The world says, up is up and down is down. God says, no, the best way up is down. Amen. 
The world thinks on a physical level, a human effort level. The world sees a ladder, and if you want to go up, you have to take each step up. You climb the corporate ladder. And in a physical world, that makes sense, doesn't it? In a physical world, if you want to go up higher, you need to go up. On a human level, that makes sense. So the world is all about self-promotion, self-assertion, self-reliance, right? God has given man an advanced brain. Now, you wouldn't know that half the time. But God has given mankind a brain that is far superior than any other creature on planet Earth. An advanced brain. And God has established physical laws that do not vary. And man, with his brain that God has given him, is able to learn and experiment and discover the natural laws that God has set in motion. Anytime we discover something, we're just discovering something God put there, that God set there, with the brain that God gave us. The natural man then works within these laws to accomplish what he accomplishes and to do what he thinks are great things. And so he uses his natural brain to meditate and postulate on things beyond his experience and then he calls that philosophy or religion or theory or worldly wisdom. So here's what we got. We got man, he's got an advanced brain. So he's able to look out at God's creation. He's able to discover the God, God's laws that God put into operation. And with those laws, he's able to build things. He's able to discover things. He's able to invent things. But then man will sit with his advanced brain. And he will meditate. And he will think. And he comes up with theories. And he comes up with philosophies. And he comes up with religions. But all his philosophies and theories and religions have to work within the framework of natural law. Because he's got a natural brain. Everything that man comes up with has to fall within the parameters of that which is physical. Because he cannot venture into the spiritual because he only has the spirit of man. You following me? So even his religion, which is supposed to be spiritual, is not spiritual, it's physical because it's a works religion. They can't get the concept on their own of grace and meritless salvation. Now they'll talk about God and angels because they'll read about it in the Bible. And they'll talk about spiritual things, but when it comes right down to it, somehow, someway, you have to do something. You have to do a work, you have to have merit, you have to accomplish something. Every religion on the planet except Christianity, Bible Christianity, is works-oriented. Why? Because that's the natural man thinking with a natural brain in a physical world with physical parameters. And so there has to be something physical for us to do, right? Even man's religions are limited by finite understanding and physical limitations. But God's wisdom is spiritual in nature because he is spirit. God's wisdom is above and beyond the physical because he's above and beyond the physical. Think about this. The spiritual created the physical. Right? That which could not be seen, created that which is seen. And that which is spiritual brought into being that which is physical. So the physical is dependent upon the spiritual. Now God is revealing to us in his word that the way truly up is down. And man goes, what? The way to exaltation is not self-promotion. It's humiliation. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. 
God says, you want to be exalted? The only way to exaltation is humiliation. God says, you want to be exalted? The only way to get exalted is to be humbled before me. To recognize who I am. And to put yourself in the position that you, should, you deserve to be in. In Luke chapter 18, verse 14, everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. But he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The word abased and humbleth comes from the same Greek word, so you could interchange them. And the word exalted means elevated. So he says, everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. Listen, every single unsaved human being that ever rose to any kind of position or status or superiority will one day be abased and humiliated by God. You understand that? Every president, every king, every potentate that has ever walked the face of the earth, unless they have humbled themselves before God and recognized Him and believed on Him, then they, if they haven't done that, no matter what they did, no matter what history says about them, they're going to be abased. But those who nobody knew, who humbled themselves before God, will one day be exalted. Now, he does that on, on earth. That happens here. You understand? The best way up is down. You want to go up? You better get down on your knees. You want to, you want to rise in your profession? Get on your knees before God. You want your business to do well? Get on your knees before God. You want to be what God wants you to be? Get on your knees before God. You want to be exalted? You want to be lifted up? Then you got to get on your face before God first. That's the best way up. Of course, this wisdom is in connection with the Lord because in 1 Peter 5, 6, it said, under the mighty hand of God. In James 4, 10, it said, in the sight of God. The born-again Christian has available a wisdom that is not available to the world. A wisdom that begins, actually, with the fear of God. Psalm 111, verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A wisdom that understands the truth of Psalm 75, where it says, lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck, for promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Now, did you notice all the directions that were given there? He said, promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. doesn't come from the south. But it left out a direction. What is it? North. north. Where does God sit? The Bible says God sits on the sides of the north. So promotion comes from above. And the only way we can have the promotion of God is to be humble before God. A wisdom that recognizes that with God, the way up is down. The second one is found in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, the second one is this. The way forward is back. The way forward is back. Luke chapter 14, verse 7. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, when thou art bidden if any man, uh, of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. And when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. Isn't that interesting? The world's wisdom is push yourself forward. And we see that all the time in traffic, right? Push yourself forward. When I read this, I thought of the college bribery scandal that's going on right now. These wealthy parents bribed and cheated and paid to get their children into prestigious Ivy League universities. And yes, they got in, but now they got to get out. See? 
They exalted themselves by pushing themselves to the front of the line, but now they're embarrassed and ashamed and are being sent to the end of the line. When they were at the front of the line because of their scandalous activity, they were all proud of themselves, they were exalted, they were in. And now they got found out. And now they're embarrassed and ashamed. You've got to walk it all back. And now they're at the end of the line. The Lord Jesus, actually, in this parable, is specifically speaking about the scribes and the Pharisees. Look over in Matthew chapter 23, where he addresses this. Matthew 23, look at verse 2. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now look at verse 5. But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Here it is. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue. And so he was watching. That's what we find that Jesus was watching. In Luke it says he was watching and he observed how they liked to take the chief seats, these these religious leaders, you know, they'd come in with all their robes and all their tassels and their big phylacteries. And they'd walk in and they'd be all spiritually proud. And they would walk up and sit in the highest rooms. And they would walk up and sit in the chiefest seats. And Jesus saw that. And he's, he preached against it. Now, one of my pet peeves is line jumping. I don't know about you, but that gets under my skin. Line jumping. You know what bothers me? When you're driving, and there's one of those lanes, you know, and this one's all backed up, and you've been patiently sitting in the lane, waiting, because that's the one that goes straight, right? This lane here has to turn left. And you've been patiently waiting and taking your turn. And here comes this guy. Comes up that left-hand lane. And he goes, ah, pulls right in front of somebody. He should be glad there's laws. <laughs> you know what I do? I get, I get right up on the guy in front of me. I get right up on his bumper. And that guy coming down that left-hand lane, he's trying to get in, he's trying to get in. I'm, mm -mm, ain't getting in here, pal. I sat and waited all that time. And then I'll see somebody, he'll get up and get in front of somebody. Ah, what's the matter with you? What'd you let him in for? <laughs> but I have a biblical, a biblical right to that attitude. That's what Jesus said, right? Next time I'm going to yell, yo, Pharisee! <laughs> I can honestly say, though, honestly, I don't ever remember jumping line. It's been a pet peeve of mine for a long time. I do remember, though, one time. I, no, this is one time my wife and I were asked to go to Disney World with a couple who had a, um, a sp um, child who had a handicap or special thing. And so we went with them. And you know them lines are like two hours long, you know? But there's another line over here <laughs> for people with handicaps and, and illnesses. And whoever's with them gets to go with them. And man, I'm walking up that line. We're passing up hundreds of people just walking right through. But I didn't look at any of them. Because <laughs> you know they're looking over at you like, wow, how come they get to go up there in front of everybody? But that's not line jumping, see? That is the principle. because. Normally, I would have gone in that big long line and waited like everybody else, but the master of the feast said, here, move up into this line and go ahead of everybody. See, that way you have honor. Line jumping is dishonor. All right, so we all got that clear, right? <laughs> now, the condition of the heart that the Lord is trying to illustrate is humility. When we're truly willing to get at the back of the line and wait our turn, then the Lord in His grace is inclined to move us up the line. Luke 13.30 says, Behold, 
There are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. There are those here in this world that have, been, that have put themselves first, but will be put last at the judgment. And those who are in this world last who will be promoted up in front of them. I remember when I was running a machine at General Electric, um, and, and I'm, I'm going to use this illustration to help you understand being content with being at the end of the line. That's what Jesus is talking about. So when you go in, you're, you're invited to a feast, don't go running up and trying to get at the head table up front somewhere. He said, you go back and sit in the back, and then you can be promoted forward. Because if you hurry up and run forward, they might come in and say, hey, we got something more important than you, you got to leave. Then you really feel bad, right? It's being content, being at the end of the line. And I remember when I was working at General Electric, I was running this machine, and, and my whole machine, I stood in this one little spot all night long. And I would take a piece, what, what was it? Oh, I'd take a piece from over here, I'd put it in my sheen, machine, when it was done, I'd take it out and put it over here. I was like a machine myself. <laughs> I did, I did it eight hours a day. I wanted to be in the ministry. I didn't have any qualifications to be in the ministry, but I wanted to be in the ministry anyway. And I remember standing at my machine, I remember running that machine, and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't want to spend the rest of my life here. I really would like to be in the ministry. I said, but if your will for me is to stay at this machine the rest of my life, and your will for my life is that I should be here at this place and be a witness here and pass out tracts and witness to people as they come in and out, as they move around, that's what I'll do. If that's your will for my life, I surrender to that. That's what I'll do. But if it's possible, I'd like to be in the ministry someday. Well, it wasn't long after that that I got moved from that machine to another section of the uh, building where I was in charge of a whole line, and it was a one-man operation, and I ended up having like four hours a night of downtime. And I asked my boss, I said, can I use that four hours to read? He said, yep. I, I've, I read a veritable library. Amen. Hundreds of books I read while I was pay, getting paid. I went to college right there Amen. at GE. And got paid. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't pay to go to college. I was being paid to get my education. And now obviously I ended up in the ministry. The whole point of the story is this. When you come to the place in your life when you are honestly and truly in your heart satisfied and settled with the Lord that you say, look, if this is your will for my life, I'm okay with that. But you're allowed to tell God your heart, Right? You have desires of your heart. You're allowed to say to God, well, Lord, I, I'd like to do something else, but if this is your perfect will for me, this is it, and I'm happy with it, and I'll do the best I can. Now you're ready for God to move you. See? And that's what he's talking about here. When we're truly willing to get at the back of the line, wait our turn, and God's ready to move us. Luke, um, <clears throat> the world says that all the beautiful and successful and the honorable and the worthy are seated at the tables up front. But God says that one day, and even in this day, there are those whom he is going to promote forward while demoting self-satisfied to the rear. You see, your life isn't over yet. You don't know what God's going to do with you. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You say, I'm, I'm 90 years old. You know what? You don't know what God's going to happen tomorrow. Any more than I do. Everything could change tomorrow, next week. God could promote you. He could take you to the front of the line. Amen. Whenever he's ready. Maybe he's ready, waiting for us to be happy that we're even in line. Huh? Maybe you should say, you know what, you should be glad what you have. You should be satisfied and happy because you got more than you deserve. And when we truly get there in our heart, then God's ready to say, okay, now we'll move up. All right. The world says that, uh, you know, and, and, and think about the day 
when we leave this world and we get that real promotion. Because the wisdom from above is that the way forward is back. And then my last one, number three, is found in Matthew chapter 10. Just turn a few pages. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 39 and Matthew chapter 16 and verse 25. So 1625 and 1039 of Matthew. And this one is the way to win is to lose. What? <laughs> the way to win is to lose. Look at Matthew chapter 10 verse 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake, shall find it. You see, it's always for Jesus. Do you notice that? Right. The way down, or the way up is down with the Lord. The way forward is back with the Lord. And the way to win is to lose. Lose to who? To the Lord. When you lose to Jesus, you win. Amen. That's good. Chapter 16, verse 25. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life, there it is again, for my sake shall find it. You know, Frank Sinatra wrote a song, I did it my way. I wonder if he still feels that way now. I bet, he I bet now I wished he hadn't have done it his way. But that's the world's wisdom, isn't it? Here's the world's wisdom. It's my life. Here's the world's wisdom. It's my body. Here's the world's wisdom. It's my money. That's the world's wisdom. Sometimes the Christian forgets that he or she has been bought with a price and that we are not our own and that we belong to God. We forget that. We lose sight of it. And we think this is my life. This is my money. This is my house. It ain't your house. Your babysitting, your house sitting. It's God's house. Some Christians think that they can live their life the way they want to, and they can. You can live your life the way you want to. You can do whatever you want to do. But while they think they're winning, they're losing. Hmm? Think about it. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ, God incarnate, the Savior, the resurrected Lord. And he says, I've got a life for you. Man, oh man, I got abundant life for you. I've got a life that's full, has fullness of joy for you. I've got a life for you. And, nah, I don't want your life. I want to keep my life. Nah, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. And you know what he says? He says, well, really? You want to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to. Uh, yeah, I'd rather just do my own thing. Really? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. But when you walk away, you lose. You lose the abundant life. You lose the joy. You lose the peace of God that passes all understanding. Amen. You lose the fullness of joy. You're going to be the loser because you wanted to keep your life and you didn't want his life. Therefore, you think you're winning, but you're really losing. So he says, you know what? If you really want to win, lose to me. Lose to me. We lose what God had for us. And we don't even realize what we've lost. That's what's sad. We lose the blessing. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. The kingdom of God begins right here. In our lives. The kingdom of God is lived by his principles and his precepts. 
The kingdom of God is lived by submission to his will for, for our life and letting go of our will for our life. We, the kingdom of God is this. Lord, this is what I had planned, but you know what? Whatever you got is better, I'm sure. Lord, this is what I was going to do, but you know what? Whatever you want me to do. Now, the Lord might say, you know what? I think I'm just going to use you over there. Fine. Now what you wanted to do and what he wanted you to do are both the same. But if you have to give one of them up, don't give up what he wants. Give up what you want because you don't really know what you want. But he knows. You don't know what's best for you, but he does. You don't know what's coming down the road, but he does. And so you take your life and say, I think I can handle it, I can steer it, I can direct this thing. He says, oh boy. And you lose what he had for you. It's allowing him to direct our path. Isn't that what the Bible says? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. It is obeying his word and leaving the results up to him. This is losing our life. That means we lose our expectations, our requirements, and our worldly wisdom and embrace his. And what do we find in this field of treasure that he mentions in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44? That field of treasure, you know what? His, his will, his life for you is the field of treasure. You know what you find? You know what the treasure is in there? The peace that passes all understanding. The contentment. Safety. Joy. Patience. Calmness of spirit. On and on. We find the fruit of the spirit and the power of the Holy Ghost over in his life. We can run on human strength, human wisdom, human ingenuity, human emotion, and human ways we learn from the world. We can do it. Or we can run on his strength, his wisdom, his insights, his emotions, and his ways. Both are going to bring different results and outcomes. One will be your life and its fruit, and one will be his life and its fruit. Who do you think is going to produce better fruit, you or Jesus? Huh? And when you get to heaven... Or you think you're going to be able to stand in the presence of the Lord and say, boy, Lord, I'm glad I picked my life. No, you're going to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I, I was a loser. I, I lost what you had for me. And I, 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 I accepted this pitiful life compared to what you had for me. Look, I don't care how good your life is. I don't care how wonderful your life is. It's pitiful compared to the life Jesus has for you. He said, if you lose, the best way to win is to lose. God gave Solomon this choice. He gave Solomon a choice when he chose him to be the king. And he said in 1 Kings chapter 9, If thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart and uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father. Wow, isn't that a great choice? You know what he's saying? He's saying, Solomon, if you lose your life and choose my life, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be a great king. And he did, didn't he? He chose wisdom over all the stuff his flesh could have desired. Yep. And here's God's principle in 1 Samuel 3, 3.30. 3.30. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. That word despise means disesteem. See? So God is saying, you know what? If you, if you want to live your life your way, that honors you. And it dishonors me. And therefore, I will have light esteem for you. But God says, if you lose your life and live my life, that honors me. And in turn, I will bring honor upon the life you're living 
because it's the life I've chosen for you. You follow that? When a Christian has God's wisdom, he or she will understand and undertake losing in order to win. Three spiritual wisdoms that are foolishness to the world. The way up is down. The way forward is back. And the way to win is to lose. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. As we think about these things, maybe we just need to, as Christians, change a direction tonight. Maybe we need to come to God and say, Lord, I, I've got all these plans, I've got all these ideas, I've got all this will, but I don't know where it's going to take me and I don't know where I'm going to end up in the end. And so, Lord, I'm just giving it to you. I, I'm gonna, I want to lose my life tonight. I don't want to find it in Christ. I want him to lead me. I want his life to be lived through me. Maybe tonight you realize the only way up is down. And you haven't been down very much humbly before God. You haven't spent much time on your face and on your knees before God. Maybe you need to start. And maybe you've just thought, you know, I'm just going to make a muscle and go forward. I'm just going to bustle my way on. And you realize you need the blessing of God. You need to get before God and say, Lord, I'll be content at the back of the line. If that's where you want me, that's where I'll be happy to be. And maybe tonight you're not saved. All the world's religions and faiths require you to work for redemption. But the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith in that, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves us. What about you? Have you been going by the world's religious wisdom, trying hard? You know what? You can try, 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 and you'll fail. Only Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's a gift. He wants you to receive the gift of eternal life by trusting him as your Savior. Anybody here tonight that needs to trust Christ as their Savior, you know that tonight is the night that you heard what you needed to hear, and you need to trust Christ as your Savior. Anybody like that at all, just look up, let me see you. I'd like to pray with you. Anybody like that? Father, how we love you tonight. And Lord, we, we've grown up in the world system. We've grown up with the world's wisdom. And sometimes we, we get to operating by default on that wisdom instead of the wisdom you've given us by your spirit and from your word. And Father, when it doesn't make sense, if it's your word, it doesn't have to make sense, really. We just need to trust it. Help us to believe and to live like the best way up is down, the best way forward is back, and the best way to win is to lose, all in reference to the Lord Jesus. Guide us and direct us now, my Father. We'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing number 223, Draw Me Nearer. 223. Maybe tonight you'd just like to come and say, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the wisdom of your word and of the Lord Jesus. Help me to live in light of it. We're going to sing 223. If the Lord spoke in your heart, feel free to come and spend a few minutes with him. If you have any questions about going to heaven, come and see me, all right? As we sing. Take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in him always. And feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Help those that are weak. Forgetting in nothing is blessing to seek. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus.
Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct his likeness shall see. Last. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Thank you, Father God, for the wisdom of your word and the wisdom that we do have as Bible believers, Lord. And we understand what was preached tonight, Lord God. The world wouldn't, Father God. And Lord, help us to put these principles and practice in our lives. Even though we know them, sometimes we get in the way and we jump out in front, Father God. Help us to see that it is not your will for our lives, Father. Someone is here watching or listening has never come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would save them, show them plainly their need, their, convict them of their sin, and show them the Savior. We'll just be careful to praise you and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.